Around the NFL Podcast. Need some toilet paper? Badly. Welcome to another edition of the Around the NFL Podcast. My name is Dan Hansis. I'm coming to you from a city filled with heroes in bunkers. Mark Sessler, Chris Wessling, and Greg Rosenthal. What is up, boys? Hey, Dan. Hey, gang. Days have no meaning anymore. I took out my garbage cans, put them on the street last night. A full 24 hours early. That was a mistake. Mm. <laughs> I can't really track the days anymore. They're all essentially the same. Uh, and that is just one of the many burden faced right here. Good, good garbage material. You know, it's like it's like that's man of the people stuff. It's just that's like right. a little slice of regular life. Do you put do you put your garbage out on the corner, Greg? Um. Yes, sometimes. I always take it in. It, we share the same um, garbage uh, canisters with the two apartments behind us. So uh, it's a group effort. I'm always ever, taking them in. Ever any heat with that? No. Sharing, sharing trash could lead to, uh, you know, neighborly squabbles. I would I'd often just take it out into the streets, you know, where, they're, where it's there all the time in the alley. Don't even mess with the... Doesn't feel like a great time to be sharing uh, refuse <laughs> with other people, Greg. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you have your own plan and direction um wes how are you buddy i'm doing well we had another uh neighbor happy hour last night we made a trip to cvs with our masks and gloves on um a- anytime you get to a store and you don't have to stand in a like a hundred yard line it's a good situation so cvs was walk right in strange because my dr- local drugstore is the same way you would think they would have some of the traffic issues not at the same level as the grocery store but for instance the shopping center right near me it's a 50 foot line to get into Vons and then um, you have Rite Aid right next door. Walk right on in. Yeah. Trader Joe's is almost right next door. And that was a long line. I've been in Trader Joe's several times since this all started and there has never been food on the shelf. So I would advise people to maybe try somewhere else. <laughs> and uh, Greg, there's Greg's beautiful uh, children. <laughs> look at the Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> Hi, Ellis. Tandem right Hey, there. Ellis. Troublemakers. <laughs> I mean, it, it plays better on video than an audio podcast. Hi, Ellis. Mode of communication. They're saying hi to you guys if you want to say hello. Ellis and Walker Rosenthal. Hello, 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 hello. Okay. <laughs> Bye-bye. <So>. Bye-bye. <laughs> gaga, gaga, poo, poo. <laughs> oh, wow. A little potty talk in a big spot. <laughs> a young Howard Stern in the making. <laughs> wow. A lot, of poop, Greg. a lot of poop talk over here. Um, poop talk's huge with the kids, man. They oh, love yeah. That. They love a lot of poop. They're learning of, about their bodies. Why would it not be a, a topic lot of, writing of about uh, poop. you know. Speaking of Howard Stern, Tom Brady going to be on Stern next week, which is suddenly free for all listeners. I, I'm curious to listen to that. Brady is going on Stern? Wow. He is. Um, April 8th, I saw them. And apparently, whatever Stern is on, they've made it free to all listeners. So yes, they have. Yeah, I am I am really curious because he's he's going to get some stuff out of Tom. Uh, he, well, Howard is cert- – I'm a Howard fan going back 20 years. He's really softened up um, – even in the last five years or so, I'd say, uh, with age and moved away from reputation and how he built his career. And he's really put a lot of focus on the celebrity interview angle. I think he's trying to massage his legacy a little bit here in the back end of his career. So I don't know if we're going to get the if Howard Stern interviewed Tom Brady uh, 15 years ago. Uh, first of all, Tom Brady's not going on the show. Uh, second of all, it's going to be a very different line of questioning. So I. I Anybody that's expecting yeah. some type of raunchy, no holds barred interview See, with Brady, uh, you might be disappointed. But it could still be a very good interview because Stern does his prep and, and he, he's very good at that. I'm not that interested in any, you know, him diving deep into the Giselle Ray relationship or not. I mean, that'd be fine. What but about I Tara bet, Reed? You want to? I bet he'll get some Reed stuff. I, he'll he'll bug him about his actual relationship with Belichick in a way that maybe he'll actually get some answers. Yeah, and he'll need help. See. Stern doesn't know anything about sports, but he has guys on his team like Baba Booey <laughs> that should be able to help out. That's an important interview. We've been um, waiting all along cool. for Baba Booey to get to the bottom <laughs> of this, and it feels like uh, it's a perfect pairing. There you go. Um, all right, today's show, uh, we're going to get caught up on some news, and uh, including the return of a player that had seemingly been forgotten, uh, and, and now he is back in the mix in the NFL after years in the desert. Um, and also we're going to talk a little bit 
we this week we've mixed it up a little bit and and thrown around some um, opportunities for each of us to come up with a, a theme of the day, uh, something to talk about for a segment or a show. Uh, Wes, you, you had a good idea uh, for today, which is? Well, we open every show as the room full of heroes, but it's with a wink. We are not heroes. We know that. Um, but now we have, you know, friends and listeners in the hospital battling COVID. We have healthcare workers dedicated uh, to fighting the virus, and some of them are listening to our podcast during downtimes between those shifts. We're finding out what heroes really are, so we're going to talk a little bit about heroes today. Sounds good. Uh, but before that, yes, let's get caught up on the news. There are plenty of things we cannot do right now, but let's focus on what we can do. We can adapt, we can adjust, and we can make better decisions yeah. right now for the betterment of the future. As I tell our team, let's keep stringing good days together and we will get through this. Yeah, there Bill, who's not fired up right now? <laughs> who's not ready to run through a wall? What what a what a, a gifted in terms of charisma I've always found uh, Belch. Well, he is the proof though. I mean, one of the great motivators and um, unquestionably one of the greatest coaches in the history of professional football. Uh, not a guy that you would think you'd be running through a wall for, strictly based on uh, the cadence of his voice. <laughs> Nicknamed Doom. <laughs> is that true? Parcells well, yeah, nicknamed Bill, Par him Doom. Bill Parcells called him Doom. Yeah, Doom. <laughs> Just walking around the corner. Here comes Doom. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> Go to Pro Football Reference, and it'll have eight other nicknames that none of us have heard of. <laughs> that's, that site seems to be off on their own project when it comes to nicknames that simply are not grounded in reality for players and coaches. All right. Let's get into it. Some news. Derek Henry <laughs> signs his $10.2 million franchise tender. Uh, ESPN's. I had to get that shot in. You know, that, <laughs> that site's been operating uh, without jurisdiction for too long. I They're just want I guess I'll just ha I'll lay it out there again because you did bring this up about two months ago. I wrote an article about this on our website. I reached out to the people there and they said that they basically put up almost anything that's sent to them. And it's a bit of like an inside joke between the readers and the website. Well, not all, That's not everyone is laughing. I, do I seem like I'm laughing about this? <laughs> no, you are not laughing at all. <laughs> Derek Henry, the Titans running back, the rushing champion, he signs that uh, franchise tender. Uh, ESPN's, ESPN's Adam Schefter added that the two sides are still committed to working for a long-term extension before June 15th. Uh, but we don't have to worry about, uh, it seems, any type of holdout because he is now under contract. He's signed. He's not going to use it as leverage. And, uh, Wes, it is a, a tough situation uh, on some level for Henry because when you look at what other skill uh, players, other playmakers in the league are making compared to what he's going to make this year potentially if he doesn't get that long-term deal, it stinks, but it's just the, it's the way of the beast. Yeah, every once in a blue moon you'll see a player under the franchise tag maybe draw a hint of interest around the league, but this is not – the off season for that, first of all, hmm. and it, he doesn't play the position for that. Secondly, I, I do think, you know, I've talked about how nobody feels sorry for fullbacks and they're practically extinct, but there's this outcry for running backs. And I do think it's unfair the way running backs are treated. I would have liked to have seen that addressed in some way uh, in the CBA um, that their greatest years, earning years are in college in their first year or two in the NFL when they're underpaid severely. So there is no mechanism for running backs to get paid what they're worth. Hmm. And I don't see a way out of that. Yeah. The rookie wage scale uh, keeps obviously their number down. And then as, as much as it stinks, like something like what happened with Todd Gurley, Greg, uh, you are an absolute superstar out of college. You're one of the best players in the league. So the Rams say, all right, we're going to rip up that contract and pay him like a superstar and make him a cornerstone. And then that blows up in their face. So that just is an, yet another caution sign that it doesn't seem like getting paid as a running back is something that's coming anytime soon. Yeah, it's unfortunate. I think it's just market dynamics. Same thing with inside linebackers and safeties, depending on the position you play. But him signing it got me thinking, all these players are signing their tag early. And I do wonder if because there's so much uncertainty out there, they want to theoretically lock up the money. And I've thought about free agents that are out there right now, like Jadevian Clowney, whether they're starting to get a little nervous because 
what if the season is <laughs> delayed? What if it affects um, your salary moving forward? What if the NFL doesn't pay all their players this year? Do you want to lock in your contract? Like, it, it's complicated, but there's reports with the NBA that some of their, you know, weekly salaries might stop sooner than later. And I, that has to start playing into the minds of how all these, like, deals are getting done. And you love this stuff, Greg, with uh, agents leaking stories to further contract negotiations. First thing that came to mind when I saw the headline that Clowney's dropped his price uh, a couple million dollars, that seemed like a situation where, despite the report that we heard uh, that Clowney might wait till training camp, Clowney probably would rather figure out a way to get paid sooner rather than later in this climate and just in general. Everybody wants to get paid rather than be left hanging. Right, you you get a signing bonus, and who knows? What if in two months they start, you know, talking about delaying the season or something, and he's just like unsigned? That's that's money you're not getting back. Well, I think what's different about Clowney is we know he has an injury history. He's got a microfracture knee surgery, and that is the type of thing that your own medical doctors are are going to want to check out before you part with twenty million dollars a year. And last note on this, Henry again, ten point two million. If he doesn't get the deal done, that's what he'll make this year. Just for some perspective, Robbie Anderson, a perfectly fine wide receiver, but by no means a star, just signed a deal with the Panthers that is essentially a one-year $12 million deal. And if you can tell me that Robbie Anderson is half the uh, playmaker and is important to his team as Derrick Henry is to his, is something's a little bit off, but I, it doesn't seem like we're getting a change anytime soon considering uh, the CBA uh, just passed. I would wonder if you're if – you're plugged in and you're 15, 16 years old and you're seeing this, I don't think the mindset at that age is just thrive at whatever you can do well, but why become a running back when you probably have the athleticism to play a different type of position or why stick around until you're a senior, unless you're clogged up by a bunch of people starting over you get out of, get out of college as a freshman or sophomore. I mean, how else do you maximize your earnings and hit the NFL at a different age? Like it's going to create some sort of, uh, reaction from human beings choosing that career. When a career dries up, uh, you know, money-wise, people make a, they make changes. So, are running backs just going to accept this for the next twenty years? Please. Let's let's move on. The uh, I don't. There's something about your sides today, Mark, that are that are humorous. Today. <laughs> I'm just trying to throw a comment in when I can. I don't know. It's like I I don't deal with the the. I, you guys got the financial stuff down perfectly. I enjoyed it. <laughs> What? It's that like day twenty-eight saying, Mark, of just like, me I just wanted to talk. I, I wanted to get back in. <laughs> no, and I, I do. I something. do believe that. It's like if I were like a star running back in high school, okay, but I could that. play multiple okay, positions. It's it. Like, we got it. go play cornerback. <laughs> go play cornerback. Those guys are getting ridiculous contracts. You know, two or three deals not, down the road. Absurd. Not sure that option's available to Derrick Henry. Well, this okay, is what this is what you want to be. You want to be a backup quarterback in the NFL. If you could just navigate your way there, you don't get any of the beating and you get a pretty nice payday. Blaine Gabbert has re-signed with the Bucks on a one year contract what a transition right there. And yes, thank you. Gabbert, who missed most of 2019 with a bad shoulder. He'll now be it's it, historically, with the exception of one season, the easiest job in pro football is to be Tom Brady's backup quarterback because Brady plays that's all he does he just plays relentlessly he never misses a week even though he's turning 43 in August but Gabbert he'll be the guy behind Brady and God forbid something happens to Tom terrific because Gabbert can't play I mean Mark we know that I you know one person who I think does believe that Blaine Gabbert can play is Bruce Arians who began the, I thought, the PR camp, not PR campaign, but like the working with Blaine Gabbert where you shifted away from ultra draft bus slash disappointment to floating some comments out there when they were with the Cardinals for a little bit saying, I believe in this guy. I think he can he can fling it. And like Arians kind of dug him. And so that's where I drew the connection was that mm. this was a known quantity. Um, I couldn't agree more that Blaine Gabbert, like if you base it on history, will be paid an incredible amount of money to go to these like the – workplace cafeteria and probably get a lot of free garb and you know shoes and sweatshirts to do essentially nothing um when it matters but that said he also the flip side is if tom brady ever went down you become one of the most annoying on-field presences of all time because not a single person in tampa who's you know gonna drop a ton of extra money to go get these season tickets ever thought they'd see blaine gabbert doing a single thing so if he hits the field we've got major issues 
In other Tampa Bay Buccaneers news, Tom Brady needs a place to live down there in Florida uh, now that he's a buck, and he will live in style. He's renting Derek Jeter's waterfront mansion in Tampa. I um, remember this was something when this place was being built, it was tabloid fodder in New York because Jeter wanted a, a wall. It's basically on the waterfront. It's massive, as you imagine. You would imagine 30,000 square feet. Jeter wanted to put up an extra like two feet high on the wall for privacy reasons. And it was known as St. Jetersburg. Mm. And I guess no one's living there. So here comes Tom, who uh, moves into the nicest house. I mean, listen, Tom Brady, you got to you got to. Well, it's not easy to be happy for Tom Brady. He's had so much greatness in his life. But this could not have been a better setup for Brady. Not only does he get to start over, he gets to head south, better weather, play with a coach who's actually nice to him, um, get that new challenge in his life, have great playmakers around him. And, oh, it just so happens that uh, one of the most famous American athletes, he builds one of the nicest houses in the country, and it's available for you to live in uh, 15 (laughs) minutes from the Bucks facility. This is a perfect setup for the guy. Oh, and he got number 12. Uh, Godwin moved off 12. I, I just wonder, does it come with like free the free gift baskets that Derek Jeter <laughs> used to give out to the women uh, that would come to his apartment? Probably I got a few left over. There's just like a button that you press and that pops out of a vending machine or something. <laughs> I, I in my in my single days in New York, I heard that story before it was you e- had even gift a story. Baskets too? Yes. The gifts. <laughs> the, I never got a gift basket, unfortunately. But I, I was uh, dating a girl whose close friend got a gift basket from Jeter. And I remember being Ooh. blown away by it. And then when it showed up in page six a couple of years later, I felt like I was on the ground floor of something special. He had been doing it for probably a decade. In New Those years. were your early days of, you know, operating as a media insider before you were being paid to do so. You should were, have reported and that, it. And that actually goes back to my, my, my one thought on Brady is, you know, you were hungry. You were living probably um, with other people in an apartment, crafting, gaining your skills. Now you've got a mid-40s quarterback who everyone just assumes is going to go 13-3, and three, um, who's 20 years older than most of the people on the roster, living in, an, in a mansion where, what, he, at, at best, he takes up 12 feet of space with all his objects. You're in a gigantic, um, like, largesse compound away from what human beings. Well, he has a family, wrong. right? Well, I mean, maybe, but I thought the family also lives in Manhattan and has all these like school obligations and other. He also stuff, has like an so. entourage. I mean, this this is a super wealthy, famous celebrity. There's there's probably a, a chef on site, maids, uh, all all sorts of people that need to keep the grounds uh, groundskeeping. Gabbard's it's a, it's a whole thing. Gabbard's yeah, ga- there, yeah. <laughs> Gabbard's in the guest house. He's in the Cato Kalen hut. Well, I mean, when you throw in the fact that Gabbard needs a living space, all my issues have gone away. So. <laughs> You're right. I, is anyone else feeling like this is just being the red carpet's being rolled out for everything to go right? And it's like that's almost how it never works in the NFL. And I'm, I want to shut everyone's you, mics off and just have Mark do the next 30 minutes I'm of the just show because like, you it's, have so I, many great takes right now. I just I just there's a little bit a little bit of an issue buzzing inside my mind about how everything is just so perfect. Like I just don't. We'll see. I hope, I hope it goes well for him. I just want to make – I mean the setup. I don't know what's going to happen when the it's season It's very starts. believable. I hope it goes well for them. Thrown in right I, lo- the I actually don't have – I don't have an axe to grind with Tom Brady, but I do think that, like, you know, oh, you're, really? you've arrived like a king. You know, you've arrived like a king, and you're and that – is not not every athlete on that roster is going to respond the same what, way. What is he? What is he? What do you want him to do? What has he done personally? How about how about like how about I don't need to read stories about you moving not into on him. like the biggest mansion it's along not on the him. oceans? Sure, I, I'm feeling Mark's take on this one. I mean, you move in, you might as well throw down a drawbridge and hire guards when you're moving into that place. The, how often does something like that just work out perfectly? Well, Tom and. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that, we're not going to hit 30 crazy. minutes today. <laughs> I'm, go, I'm going further. Tom and Giselle did build that big uh, place out here. They spent like, you know, tens of millions of dollars for two or three years. And then they just never even lived in it. They're like, oh, I guess we're not going to live out here. That's it's an investment. Tough is break the, for them. That's what they say. That's what they say. Real I think Dr. Dre is moved in. I just love that like literally a week ago, Mark went on and on and on about Martha Ford's like massive estate and how he'd do anything <laughs> to live there. And now yeah, he's like that, Tom Brady in this castle. Well, like. that dis- the distinct, uh, the, the point of departure there is that benefits me. 
Right. right. Uh, and right. I'm not I like I don't need to worry about Tom Brady is fine. If I were suddenly living in a mansion with someone that would be with probably Ford. thinking about right. who are the people that mattered most with me when you know when Martha a lot of Ford. people forgot about me who mattered most. This Martha. Mark Sessler character is in here helping doing chores. You Plus, know, it's like, it, you know, what did Tom Brady do to earn earn that sort of money? Just like, you know, the greatest player in the sports history. Martha Ford was born into the Ford family. She deserved I, I'm not I like I'm not saying that Martha Ford should have as much money as she has. That's not the I, Tom Brady. I, I've said what I need to say. I think Tom you, Brady you was born in Indonesia. Point. He'd be poor. We're pushing heroes into tomorrow. We're just talking Brady's <laughs> abode the rest of the show. <laughs> the Cowboys have brought. Alden Smith back from the dead. Uh, he signs the former Niners pass rusher to a one-year, $2 million contract. Smith's still waiting to be reinstated uh, from the NFL. He had various off-the-field issues, including um, a domestic abuse plea deal, some DUIs, just a total mess. And he ruined a career that had started as you know one of the more productive pass rushers we've seen in recent times. And he basically just put a stick of dynamite under his own career. Well, now he's back. He's got a payday, uh, as modest as it is. And you would imagine, Greg, that the Cowboys expect this uh, suspension to um, be lifted if uh, they're going to pay this guy $2 million. Yeah, they probably got an indication. He has more sacks in his first two seasons than any player in NFL history. So if he if his head's on straight and he doesn't have the substance abuse problems, which is really what derailed him first... Um, didn't Why he not? have like 19 sacks as a 22 year old? It was something absurd. I remember. I think he had 30, yeah, 30, 30 something in his first two years. 33, I think, which is outrageous. Okay, but let's. Okay, this has never happened before, right? He'll be 31 in September. The last time he was the Alden Smith we remember, where he was impacting games, he was 24 years old. Right. So there's going to be six to seven years between when he was a star and when he's going to be playing for the Cowboys. I, I, the, the only guy I thought of was Roger Staubach, who had a four-year Navy mission and could not play in those four years. I can't remember anybody taking six years off or six years between major impacts in the NFL. There's no guaranteed money in the deal. So for, for the Cowboys, they probably look at it as like there's zero risk at, from their perspective. Who was that troubled Jaguars receiver that came out about seven Justin years Justin Blackman? Ago? Justin Blackman. Yeah, I remember when he was having – his issues uh one of the reports that eventually came out was that one of the reasons why he wasn't getting a second shot beyond his off the field issues was that he had been away from the game for so long that that scene is something that guys just can't come back from if you disappear it doesn't matter if you're still physically in your prime it's hard to get back that burst and explosion you explosion you once had alden smith that's going to be a challenge for him you imagine yeah no doubt alden smith has been you know working out non-stop in the uh, space of time that we've not seen him on the field Based on what we know, I feel like it's got to be a 24-7 get-the-body-right operation. Mission. Speaking of doom, I mean. Uh... <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, like it's a, if he makes the team, I'd be surprised. <laughs> Debbie Downer. I mean, I'm not rooting for Alden Smith, to be honest with you. So I don't, if, you're, if your premonition that he might be 370 pounds is uh, true, that's I don't fine. think that. I just like when we it's like suddenly we're going to lose him for three, you know, three months to a soft tissue injury. I won't be stunned. <laughs> <laughs> soft right. tissue well, injury. I mean, we've been it's we're three weeks into the bunker cast. So I, I think we, it, it's having an impact. You know? Mark, you're killing me today. Uh, Tyrod Taylor, he's the front runner uh, to be the Chargers starting QB in week one. And that's coming straight from the horse's mouth. Anthony Lynn, the head coach of the L.A. Chargers. Uh, here's what Anthony had to say on Wednesday. I brought him in last year and I knew that we, if we needed him to start, if something happened to Phil, Phil Rivers, since departed, uh, not dead, he's on the Colts now, then he could go in and start. I'm very familiar with Tyrod. I would say right now it looks like he's in the driver's seat, but no position is final until we get to training camp right now. Coach speak, Wes? Yeah, I think any time a coach leaves himself an out, there are plans to use it at some point. Hmm. So to me, that he's leaving himself an out. That door is open. How is Cam Newton, uh, Greg, not a better uh, option here? It makes no sense to me, but it really sounds like they're not interested in Cam Newton. 
the the, the out I think is that they're going to draft someone, whether it's with the number six pick or whether they move up to to draft someone. I think they're drafting someone with that pick. And, I'm with and, you, and I like I I Anthony Lynn's fascination with Tyrod Taylor tracks back to the Rex Ryan Bills, and it, I I think it's to me it kind of vibes Jacoby Brissett. Like we like this guy, we like this player, but without the full year of Tyrod Taylor, it may never happen. I I if they don't pick a quarterback or, or move up to get the quarterback they want in the draft, I would be. Would anyone else not be shocked? I would be shocked. 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 That's what they're doing. So this is just, the, you know, this is whistling Dixie until in case everything goes wrong. Well, if they don't have much time to practice, though, he I could see Tyrod like when he was with Baker Mayfield starting early in the year. Uh, you miss the whole offseason. It's tough. He's been in that system. And then they bench him in week four. And finally, uh, some college football player news. Mike Garofolo of NFL Network reports that Alabama quarterback Tua with the hip injury, underwent another medical check um, and received, quote, overwhelmingly positive, close quote, news. Uh, He has fulfilled all medical obligations, um, rap sheet, ads, and it just seems like this guy's going to be a full go. Uh, Maybe, I guess we've heard that he might be, it might be a situation where he could be a potential redshirt guy as they, they want to ease a, a gifted first round prospect into the NFL mix. We'll see how that plays out. But in terms of teams having a a reason to be concerned heading into draft day, Mark, it seems like uh, Tua is in the clear. Yeah. I mean, the, the reports are pretty glowing and I think we can trust how the process went and it, it opens the door. And I, at this point, anyone like knocking down a, what will be a franchise exciting team altering quarterback because of an injury that's fading away. I don't know what that team would be. It just seems like all bets are on for the dolphins or someone else to come grab this guy. That's what's happening in the news. Actually one more, a little developing news. So let's, uh, let's, uh, head toward to the studio for some developing news. We have a new fan. He's on the radar. D. Orlando Ledbetter checking in on Twitter. Here's the tweet. Hey, guys, at Around the NFL. Thanks for shout out on the Top 30 QB podcast. Got my steps in this morning listening to you all. Great job. At Dan Hansis, at Greg Rosenthal, and at Chris Wessling. D. Orlando Ledbetter of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. A lot to unpack here, guys. Uh, where do we want to start, Greg? Wow. Well, I think you know the first thing. It's it's a it's a great feeling to have that sort of respect and know we're connecting with someone as great as as D led. Uh, but you just had to notice whose name was was missing there. The man, um, Mark Sessler, who's who's reached out to D led and mentioned what a men- what a hero he is to him. It's and hard just to notice in terms of context on. A show earlier this week, I talked about how I kind of looked up to Matt Money Smith and Dave Damashek, certainly when I first started this company and was getting to know them. And then, Mark, you had chimed in with D-Led as somebody that you looked up to. Uh, where are you at right now when you see this tweet and the thoughts on your name not being in there? Do you think there's something more to this? Do you think it was just an honest mistake? Take us through your thought process right here. Reeling. I mean, I'm reeling mentally because I, I thought of anyone – attached to our our product i made it clear that you know dating back to early combines i went to that this was someone i'd see across the room uh operating as a pfwa uh lieutenant doing a great job wrangling um pool reports from people it's clear in the past that i wanted to join that organization they said no to me so i i don't know if it's attached to um like an organizational pfwa wide uh ban on my work or if it's more personal um, or if it's an oversight because we do get tweets occasionally where um, and I don't see them because my name is left out of the group <laughs> where the others are thanked for uh, their service. So I, I'm baffled. Um, like I said, I mentally am catching up uh, to the whole thing, certainly emotionally. Um, but I, I'm not going to draw any final conclusions until I have more information because I am at the at the I am a reporter myself, so I want to deal in facts and what I have to work with. Was what was this? Wes, uh, there's probably a second part to this. The omission of Mark's name uh, on purpose or accidental? Oh, it's on purpose. 
Well, I, don't, I don't understand what the motivation would be. I mean, he heard the words come out of Mark's mouth, and then the one person not mentioned in the tweet is the person who was talking about him. I'd say that's a draw-your-own-conclusion situation. My conclusion is it was done on purpose. Now, what that purpose was, mm. I'm not sure. Well, he I'm just, leaning, yeah, I'm leaning towards West that it's a little bit of a wink and a nod. Hey, y'all, I'm listening, and uh, I see you, smart Alec. I think that's kind of the uh, the angle. <laughs> smart Alec. I mean, yeah. is that that's? Hey, he's, okay. it's basically like, hey, Stinky Davis, I'm right here. Well, and <laughs> this isn't the first time, you know, D led um, a legend. Um, his name's been mentioned lately. Uh, you know, there was a a ranking that Mark put out a few weeks ago. Um, <laughs> That upset, we, we know Peter Schrager, uh, a trusted uh, man in the industry for his omission. And, and D Led did make that list, but maybe, maybe he wasn't thrilled about his placement on that list either. Well, Final. so we wanted to be higher. I mean, I guess that, that's a fair place to start from the argument, but I feel like my beeline through this has been, ra- you know, like pointing to his work as something that's, you know, a, a great part of our industry. And what's the so, action step here, Mark? I mean, my move is to like again. I'm ga- I'm in the gathering information portion of this, so uh, not a lot of proactive. Still? I'm not I'm not engaging. I'm just gonna see where we are a week from now. It's just like with many things in our country, Dan. Well, the mm. one sure well thing put. about this situation is it is your move. Well, that's the true. onus. Well, he gave you the onus. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know if I have to do anything at all. But I'm I am I all things are on the table as possibility. Well, we at this we point. know he's he's aware. Because, I mean, I think since we even started uh, taping this, he, he liked a tweet where, you know, I just said, thanks, d Led. I just wanted to recognize his tweet. So Smart the interaction's right. happening. He's listening to the show. He's, he's interacting on Twitter. It, it's, it's a conversation. Yeah, that part of it I don't like at all, <laughs> that, he, that you're all raising up, you know, esteem-wise in his eyes, and I have been left uh, in a perilous place, a bad place, frankly, and well, I'm, I'm confused as to why. Have we ever done, like, three minutes of the show that is more just for us? I'm gonna I'm gonna reply to him right now too. Thanks, D Led. You the man. I'm gonna reply too. As the producer of the show, I really appreciate you listening. (laughs) Well, see, that's you know, you want to see Stinky Davis references. They're they're all over the place. That's you're just pouring salt into the theoretical wound. It's gasoline (laughs) on the fire, really. Um, All right. Well, we'll we'll continue to track this developing story. As we get more information, we will bring it to you, the listener. d led game. d led it. Fully led it. All right, Wes. <clears throat> Let's cut the funny business. Let's get real. Go ahead, Wes. Take it over. Well, this is a sports show, and I think I would start out by saying picture the closing seconds of a tightly fought championship game basketball, football, baseball, the camera inevitably finds some 10-year-old bawling his eyes out. Because at that age, you worship your sports heroes. You want to emulate them. You go out in the backyard. If you're my age, you know, you literally pretend you were Michael Jordan or Pete Rose or Johnny Bench. Um, If you're younger, maybe uh, LeBron James or Lamar Jackson. And Freud would say we're we're fixating on ideals of masculinity as we try to develop our own identities. And eventually we grow out of that phase. And with the exception of some generational icons like a Jackie Robinson or a Muhammad Ali, we tend to shift our focus to heroes who take a personal risk for the common good, often while others remain passive. That's what a hero is. And it's a concept that's deeply valued across cultures. The earliest campfire tales gave us stories of heroes, you know, sort of like modern lighthouses helping us find our way in the dark, at, you know, as long as we look out for them. And the key to heroism is a concern for other people. It doesn't happen in the absence of compassion or self-sacrifice. Uh, I know you guys all remember the Stanford um, prison experiments. Psychologist named Philip Zimbardo. Uh, he noted that there is a banality of evil. Under certain conditions and pressures, ordinary people can commit acts that would otherwise be unthinkable. And after three years, three decades of studying evil, he became entranced with the flip side of that coin, sort of a banality of heroism where anybody can be a hero. 99% of us come out of the womb with the potential uh, for both good and evil, depending on circumstances and character. Think about your greatest 
your favorite films, TV shows, uh, theater, literature, you place a human being in a crucible and see how he or she reacts. Circumstances shape our lives. And you don't need to be a superhuman to be a hero. Many heroes feel sort of a moral tickle in their brains where you, you can't ignore it anymore. It keeps grinding away at you until you act out on that. And I think a lot of us are reluctant heroes. The bell curve has villains on one side, heroes at the other, and a bunch of us as bystanders in the middle. Um, and to me, this is where the experts come in. We live in a country with a steep history of anti-intellectualism, and it's getting worse uh, with the prevailing sentiment across cable news that my ignorance is as valid as your knowledge. Um, so I, I want to take this time to thank our scientists, doctors, nurses, some of our greatest experts. I'm here today because of their expertise. If I had been diagnosed with esophageal cancer in an earlier generation, this podcast would feature Dan, Mark, Greg, and an attractive female in the fourth chair. Mm. Um, and I think right now, while I'm crying out for more attention for our experts, we have a leadership vacuum. We have top-down chaos right now um, during the coronavirus pandemic. We have a governor of Georgia who said just in the last 24 hours, we didn't know until these last 24 hours that individuals could infect people before they ever felt bad. Um, we knew. We knew. Um, some of our experts... Um, some of our politicians did not know, but our experts did. And I think one good thing that we're seeing coming out of this is that ordinary Americans are filling in the holes of that leadership vacuum. Um, and I think about a guy who's been on this podcast, um, Zach Goldman. And he's a hero to me. Um, he has been apoplectic about Americans congregating in public for the past five weeks, stressing the importance of flattening the curve thinking beyond yourself, showing compassion, that even if you are not showing symptoms, you can carry this disease and it can affect other people. Um, I, I, you know, Zimbardo, the psychologist I talked about with the, with the prison experiment, he noted the heroes generally possess an expanded worldview and greater positivity than the rest of us. And I think that describes Zach Goldman. He does have an expanded worldview. He is setting an example. Um, he, he engenders wisdom and respect for expertise, truth-telling, and compassion. And I think that that's what we need from heroes because heroism is a chain. When we see other people doing it, we do it ourselves. So um, I, I, um, I want to put Zach up as a hero and see if any of you guys have heroes. Well, Zach is, yeah, definitely an enlightened dude. Um, and I think the more people that take this as seriously as Zach is – uh, the better. Unfortunately, that hasn't necessarily been the case, going back to a lot of things that you're saying. I think it's, yeah, I think it's it's maybe on the nose, but it, it has to be said that the all the medical professionals that are out on the front lines here and don't have the right, enough supplies, uh, don't have the necessary protection, are completely overwhelmed, and it's only getting more and more overwhelming with each day as we appro approach the apex of this. Um, it's it's frightening because if we if we lose if we lose these people what what happens after that that's what part of what makes us really scary and my mom um, is retired now but she was a registered nurse and she used to tell me stories when she was working in the ER um, that is not an easy job in the best of times that is a that is a uh, unforgiving the hours are difficult the people that you deal with. Um, sometimes it's not the best situation. So now you take all that and you, you crank it up from a 10 to a 100 out of 10 and you, and you understand what these people have. And, and like us, we, we struggle with, um, the challenges of working from home. You know, a lot of these people have families at home. Um, so that to me is, is really where, where I think, um, people need to keep these medical professionals in mind because they don't have the choice to stay home and they are putting their lives at risk. Yeah, it's well said. Like in in Italy, which has been hit, you know, per capita, probably worse worse than anywhere. I think fifteen to twenty percent of their cases of coronavirus are, are healthcare workers, and you're starting to see that here too. You're starting to see that in a lot of these public jobs. Uh, there's more, you know, police and firemen uh, with COVID nineteen in New York than entire states have in New York City alone than entire states have, um, and so they're on the front lines. But it, it really stands out to me like 
what's essential and not essential in these times and how many of the essential jobs are some of like the the lowest paid <laughs> and you you think i think about like the lady beatrice at, at bonds across the street that i see every single morning who i i spoke with and she she's worked she's i think she said like 26 straight days <laughs> when i wow. talked to her and she's just showing up every shift i mean not everyone is she's healthy and, and she just keeps doing it like we were thankful to have like you know delivery um, or, or pick up for restaurants. If you're doing that, like that, that cooks in a kitchen, you know, and they are not getting paid. Like the people keeping the restaurants open, they are losing money on those restaurants. Like they're like this delivery is making killed. They're getting absolutely killed, but they're keeping it open and they're cooking for you. Uh, and they're, and they're putting themselves, uh, at risk. Yeah. I would, I would add to that just that, you know, I, you guys mentioned CVS and I feel like I've, um, use CVS as a, as a gag in the past, but <laughs> I've been there like every day because I don't want to do the long line grocery store thing. We, we're lucky enough to live in LA where you can, um, with a nice tip, have groceries delivered to your house on a five or six day lag. And so we've used that just based out of um, not wanting to spend hours doing that. But going into CVS, I've seen two or three of the same people that are logging um, insane long hours there, not getting paid well, but they are providing essential services. We're talking about like people's medicine. We're talking about uh, what, there is still water there, that kind of stuff. But I, another thing that hit me um, a little bit more personally, uh, because I, I, I think that we're talking about these people that have been put in this tough position. I think a lot of like, a lot of ch like school children and children in general who don't have the um, worldview that we're talking about that many heroes would have where you kind of get the larger struggle. Their world's very small. Um, they have a lot of fears that they don't really enunciate or are able to even kind of unpack. And I like w when we found out the kids were going to be home for at first weeks and then uh, probably months um, in our house, we were very concerned. Uh, we have been told, and I'll just be real about this, like by our pediatrician, that our two children are in quotes active, um, which is a code word for a lot of ha a lot to handle. And um, they <laughs> they are a delightful. But the the other side is when we've got into trouble, it's when we've had too much cabin fever. And so our success in the past has been to get everyone out of the house and go do lots of stuff and split them up and then bring them back together. And there's none of that. And so we were very concerned. And as were many other parents, just with the overall combustible nature of having um, kids home where parents are trying to work. My little boys, and I think this is true with a lot of kids I'm seeing, have adjusted really well. And they've been um, adaptable and super positive. And, and they've kind of surprised me. And I think sometimes like a heroic quality is you didn't really know if you had it in you or someone else uh, close to you has it in them. And I'm kind of um, thrilled with how uh, it's helped our family because they've been kind of in their, at seven and nine, really stepping up to be teammates versus just serve me this and that all day long. But logging on like with their homework and seeing 15 or 16 other kids in a Zoom chat room who are also doing the best they can and trying not to just give in to fear and, and not knowing what's happening to America. Credit to them because I, don't, I can't imagine... Um, being a child of a certain age where you realize that if you that how much the country has changed I, maybe they don't understand but if they do they're handling it better than a lot of um a people i see on twitter and adults in general you know ellis found out yesterday my daughter that school's canceled for the rest of the year i mean she you could have sent her to the moon she was damn you know this is the best <laughs> right thing, the, best thing part of it they like the, some of the aspects are quite She's delightful eight, from yeah. a, inside the house yeah uh, the innocence of youth is on wild display during this entire <laughs> catastrophe because the less they understand of the real world, uh, the better. And all they, they're they really getting to hang out with their family and, and their mom and dad, who are the coolest people in the world, uh, when you're in the age of my kids and you're, and you're the age of your children. So that's a cool thing. Um, anything else you wanted to add, Wes, before we uh, say goodbye? Is there anything Ricky wants to add? Oh, Ricky, sorry. I just want to echo the sentiments that you guys have been saying. I mean, I'm just blown away whenever I go to the grocery store. And like you said, Greg, people are, are still there. And it's like the people that get paid pretty much the lowest on the totem pole besides, you know, healthcare workers are the ones that are literally keeping us all alive. I mean, the grocery stores are open. They're there. They're happy. They're trying to make people safe. I think um, the airline workers who are showing up with masks and whatever to get people to where they need to be for safety, like essential travel, I think is so brave. 
Um, a lot of these people can afford to take time off. And I just feel so fortunate that we're able to work from home. We're not worried about our jobs. Like there's so many people and so many families that are scared right now. And it just like gives me a totally new perspective and appreciation when I wake up every morning. Like I just, I want to do whatever I can to help. And I, it's, it's just, there's only so much that someone like me could do. Um, and I'd like to say that like a lot of people I'm seeing on Twitter, like I don't think it's all necessarily about money, but I think a lot of people that are like, hey, if, if you're a waitress, like let me send you a $20 tip to go get your coffee or whatever. I just feel like to see all these people like coming together to help other people. And like Wes, you said with, with the whole top down thing in our government, like I do feel really discouraged sometimes about humanity and how people think and how people feel. Wow. Uh, but there is a positive that comes out of this. I think the reason why I was attracted to this topic is because I have a serious craving for some semblance of leadership right now. And you can find all kinds of definitions for heroes. There is not one definition, but what they do have is they improve lives and they inspire positive change. And heroism is really the high watermark of human behavior. So for me, that that really nourished something that I needed to be nourished to mm -hmm. read about heroes and think about heroes. And and where you're reading it, it, it sticks out to me is is often in these newspapers, and I've thought a lot about journalists the last couple of months, like how how invaluable and like heroic some of the work that that journalists are doing. Like I think back to a couple of months ago, the reporting from the New York Times inside of Wuhan during what at the time seemed like an incredibly dystopic future that no one could possibly imagine. And I was like, I can't believe this is actually existing in the world. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, it's come to us. It's not, you know, quite. Um, as uh, draconian, I guess, as w what happened there. But you see that like the reporting from whether it's the L.A. Times or or New York Times or, or where, wherever, like the, the people that are out there doing that reporting, it really is a public service and, it, and it's not easy. And they're putting themselves on the line, too. Um, OK, and just one final thought I had. It's we are at as of this morning, 5000 people have died in this country alone including 1000 in one day yesterday I, I saw a new york city city councilman said he has five people he knows and are friends with who have died already more, more people city in the tri-state area have now have now you know lost their lives than in 9-11 i mean that is outrageous i my family is all based in new york where i come from in rockland county um as of yesterday, there were 1,400 confirmed cases, which is more than 33 states. My sister lives there, her husband, her two kids, uh, my brother. Um, so it's very scary. And I, I just wanted to uh, shine a light on one of the victims and people that know me uh, know that I love music and I love uh, alternative rock. And um, one person who, who died uh, yesterday, in fact, was uh, Adam Schlesinger of uh, Fountain of Wayne. Uh, he was the songwriter. Uh, he's 52 years old, and um, he died from complications of the coronavirus. And this guy was um, a gifted, uh, like power pop songwriter type of guy that I would imagine other songwriters envied for his ability to write a hook. And he wrote for movies, he wrote for television, he wrote for Broadway, and um, he had one kind of big radio hit, which was Stacy's Mom in 2003. That. Um, a lot of people know, but if you actually um, want to listen to some great alternative, like post grunge, alternative power pop, uh, pull up like a greatest hits of Fountains of Wayne and uh, and, and remember uh, this guy that way, because uh, he uh, is just an example of how people are getting struck down. And it doesn't really matter how old you are. Um, uh, and uh, it's just so sad. And it's going to continue to mount the numbers and the amount of people that are going to die. And I think that is the one thing that me and I think a lot of people are not really able to fully process yet of how many people are dying right now. Um, so I just wanted to mention him and um, and uh, end the show by uh, playing out uh, one of his most well-known songs, uh, which is actually from uh, the movie That Thing You Do. Uh, he wrote the song, um, uh, the title song from that movie, and it's one of his more uh, beloved uh, compositions ever. So um, I thought that was great stuff from everybody there and everybody listening that has reached out to us and said, 
thank you for doing it every day. Well, I guess this is just do doing our part to kind of help uh, during all this. And um, but obviously, like Wes said, yeah, there are actual heroes involved here now. We don't get to, we don't get that corner anymore. <laughs> How do we get the corner back? Uh, it's going to take a lot. All right. It's it's not happening anytime soon. <laughs>